Chapter Twenty Two of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter Twenty Two. Robert Taylor. Many of the readers of this number will, from their own memories, be better able to do justice to him, whom Henry Hunt named the Devil's Chaplain, than we shall in our limited space. Robert Taylor was born at Edmonton in the county of Middlesex on the 18th of August, 1784. His family was highly respectable, and his parents were in affluent circumstances but being a younger son in a family of eleven children it was necessary that robert taylor should follow some profession his father died when he was about seven years old leaving him under the guardianship of a paternal uncle when seventeen years of age he was apprenticed to a surgeon at birmingham and studied medicine afterward under sir astley cooper and mr clive passing the college of surgeons with considerable eclat when about twenty-three he became acquainted with the rev thomas cotterell a clergyman of the established church of high evangelical principles who induced him to quit physics for metaphysics and in eighteen o nine robert taylor entered st john's college cambridge and in eighteen thirteen took his degree of bachelor of arts he was publicly complimented by the master of the college as a singular honor to the university in his scholarship, and was ordained on the 14th of March, 1813, by the Bishop of Chichester. From that time until 1818, Taylor officiated as curate at Midhurst. Here he became acquainted with a person named Ayling, who held deistical opinions, and who induced Taylor to read various free-thinking works. This soon resulted in an avowal of deism on the part of Taylor, who tendered his resignation to his bishop. His friends and family were much alarmed, and much pressure was brought to bear upon him, and we regret to state that it had the effect of producing a temporary recantation. This, however, brought Taylor no relief. He found himself in distress and shunned by his family. Through the kindness of an old friend he obtained the curacy of Yardley near Birmingham, but his previous apostasy having reached the ears of the bishop, the necessary license was refused, and the rector received a peremptory notice to dismiss Taylor. This harsh treatment caused a reaction, and while the rector sought another curate, Taylor preached a series of sermons, by means of which he shook the faith of nearly the whole of his congregation. The following is an abstract of his last sermon at Yardley. The text was, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12.40 He began, Then this glorious miracle of the man having been swallowed alive by a fish, and remaining alive for seventy-two hours, undigested and unhurt, in the fish's bowels, and being vomited up unhurt and safe upon the dry land, was as true as the gospel, and consequently the gospel was as true, but not more true than this seasick miracle. He inferred that no person could have a right to pretend to believe in the death and resurrection of Christ, who had the least doubt as to the reality of the deglutition and evomitation of the prophet Jonah. As to the natural improbabilities and physical impossibilities of this very wonderful Bible miracle, these were nothing in the way of a true and lively faith. Where miracles of any sort were concerned, there could be no distinction into the greater and the less, since infinite power was as necessary to the reality of the least as to the greatest. We should never forget that it was the Lord who prepared the fish, 
and prepared him for the express purpose of swallowing the man, and probably gave him a little opening physic to cleanse the apartment for the accommodation of its intended tenant, and had the purpose been that the whole ship and all the crew should have been swallowed as well as he, there's no doubt that they could have been equally well accommodated. But as to what some wicked infidels objected about the swallow of the whale being too narrow to admit the passage of the man, it only required a little stretching, and even a herring or a sprat might have gulped him. He enlarged most copiously on the circumstance of the Lord speaking to the fish, in order to cause him to vomit, and insisted on the natural efficacy of the Lord which was quite enough to make anybody sick. He pointed out the many interesting examples of faith and obedience which had been set by the scaly race, who were not only at all times easy to be caught in the gospel net, when thrown over them by the preaching of the word, but were always ready to surrender their existence to the Almighty whenever he pleased to drop em a line that as the first preachers of the gospel were fishermen, so the preachers of the gospel to this day might truly be said to be looking after the loaves and fishes, and they who, as the scripture says, are wise to catch souls, s-o-l-e-s, -E speak to them for no other purpose than that for which the Lord spake unto the whale, that is, to ascertain how much they can swallow. The moral of this pungent persiflage, aimed to admonish the proud and uncharitable believer, who expected his acceptance with the deity, on the score of his credulity, that when his credulity was fairly put to trial, it might be found that he was in reality as far from believing what he did not take to be true as the most honest and avowed infidel. Thou then who wouldst put a trick upon infinite wisdom, and preferest the imagined merit of a weak understanding to the real utility of an honest heart, thou who wouldst compound for sins thou art inclined to, by damning those hast no mind to. Hast thou no fears for thy presumptuous self? Thou believest only that which seemeth to thee to be true, and what does the atheist less? And that which appeareth to be a lie thou rejectest, what does the atheist more? Can we think that God has given us reason only to betray us, and made us so much superior to the brute creation only to deal with us so much worse than they, to punish us for making the best use we could of the faculties he has given us, and to make the very excellence of our nature the cause of our damnation? This concluded his connection with the Church of England and his brother having consented to make him an allowance of one pound per week if he would quit England, he retired to the Isle of Man. After nine weeks his brother ceased to remit, and to support himself Taylor wrote for the two newspapers, then published in the island. But his articles attracting attention, he was summoned before the bishop, and compelled to quit the island under a threat of imprisonment. In deep distress he went to Dublin, where he lectured on deism until 1824, when he came to London and founded the Christian Evidence Society. Many of the disclosures delivered by him were printed in The Lion, which was first published in 1828. In 1827 Mr. Taylor was tried at Guildhall for blasphemy, and was sentenced to imprisonment in Oakham jail for one year. In Oakham he wrote The Diagesis and the Syntagma. After his release from prison in 1829, he, together with Richard Carlyle, made a tour through England on an infidel mission, commencing with a challenge to the Cambridge University. 
In 1830 and 1831 he delivered a series of discourses which are printed together under the title of The Devil's Pulpit. On the 4th of July, 1831, he was again tried for blasphemy and sentenced to two years' imprisonment. In 1833, he delivered a number of discourses which were printed in the Philolithian. He was the friend and companion of Richard Carlyle for several years. It is difficult to quote from Robert Taylor's works, unless at the risk of doing him great injustice, and we must therefore refer our readers to the works we have named. The following is from The Devil's Pulpit. The gentlemen who distribute religious tracts, the general body of dissenting preachers, and almost all persons engaged in the trade of religion, imagine themselves to have a mighty advantage against infidels, upon the strength of that last and reckless argument that whether the christian religion be true or false there can be no harm in believing and that belief is at any rate the safe side now to say nothing of this old popish argument which a sensible man must see is the very essence of popery and would oblige us to believe all the absurdities and nonsense in the world inasmuch as if there be no harm in believing and there be some harm and danger in not believing the more we believe the better and all the argument necessary for any religion whatever would be that it should frighten us out of our wits the more terrible the more true and it would be our duty to become the converts of that religion whatever it might be whose priests could swear the loudest and damn and curse the fiercest but i am here to grapple with this popery in disguise this wolfish argument in sheepish clothing upon scriptural ground and on scriptural ground only taking the scriptures of the Old and New Testament for this argument's sake to be divine authority. The question proposed is, whether is the believer or the unbeliever the more likely to be saved, taking the scriptures to be of divine authority? And I stand here on this divine authority to prove that the unbeliever is the more likely to be saved that unbelief and not belief is the safe side, and that a man is more likely to be damned for believing the gospel and because of his having believed it than for rejecting and despising it as I do. But if a patient hearing be more than good Christians be minded to give us, when thus advanced to meet them on their own ground, their impatience and intolerance itself will supply the evidence and demonstration of the fact that, after all, they dare not stand to the text of their own book, that it is not the Bible that they go by, nor God whom they regard, but that they want to be God a mighties themselves, and would have us take their words for God's words. You must read it as they read it, and understand it as they understand it. You must skip and go on just where a hard word comes in the way of the sense they choose to put upon it. You must believe what the book contains, what you see with your own eyes that it does not contain. You must shut your eyes and not see what it does contain, or you'll be none the nearer the mark of their liking. Taking the authority of Scripture for this argument's sake to be decisive, I address the believer who would give himself airs of superiority, would chuckle in an imaginary safety in believing, and presume to threaten the unbeliever as being in a worse case, or more dangerous plight, than he. Hast thou no fears for thy presumptuous self? when on the showing of thine own book the safety, if safety there be, is all on the unbelieving side, when for any one text that can be produced seeming to hold out any advantage or safety in believing, 
we can produce two in which the better hope is held out to the unbeliever for any one apparent exhortation to believe we can produce two forbiddances to believe and many threatenings of god's vengeance too and for the crime and folly of believing to this proof i proceed by showing you first what the denunciations of god's vengeance are with no comment of mine but in the words of the text itself second that these dreadful denunciations are threatened to believers and that they are not threatened to unbelievers and third that all possible advantages and safety which believing could confer on any man are likely and more likely to be confirmed on the unbeliever than on the believer that the danger of the believer is so extreme that no greater danger can possibly be first what are the denunciations of god's vengeance there are says the holy revelation fourteen ten who shall drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever and they have no rest day or night there's glad tidings of great joy for you the christian may get over the terror of this denunciation by the selfish and ungenerous chuckle of his ah well these were very wicked people and must have deserved their doom it need not alarm us it doesn't apply to us but good-hearted men would rather say it does apply we cannot be indifferent to the misery of our fellow-creatures the self-same heaven that frowns on them looks lowering upon us and who were they and what was their offence was it atheism was it deism was it infidelity no it was for church and chapel going it was for adoring believing and worshipping they worshipped the beast I know not what beast they worship, but I know that if you go into any of our churches and chapels at this day, you will find them worshipping the Lamb, and if worshipping a Lamb be not most suspiciously like worshipping a beast, you may keep the color in your cheeks while mine are blanched with fear. The unbeliever only can be absolutely safe from this danger. He only who has no religion at all is sure not to be of the wrong religion he who worships neither god nor devil is sure not to mistake one of those gentlemen for the other but will it be pretended that these are only metaphors of speech that the thing said is not the thing that's meant why then they are very ugly metaphors and what is saying that which you don't mean and meaning the contrary to what you say but lying and what worse can become of the infidel who makes it the rule of his life to hear and speak the plain and simple truth than of the christian whose religion itself is a system of metaphors and allegories of double meanings of quirk and quiddities in dread defiance of the text that warns him that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone revelation twenty one eight is it a parable that man may merely entertain his imagination withal and think no more on it though not a word be hinted about a parabolical signification and the text stands in the mouth of him who we are told was the truth itself and he it is who brought life and immortality to light that hath described in the sixteenth of luke such an immortality as that of one who was a sincere believer a son of abraham who took the bible for the rule of his life and was anxious to promote the salvation of his brethren yet found for himself no saviour no salvation 
but in hell he lifteth up his eyes being in torment and saith father abraham have mercy on me and send lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for i am tormented in this flame but that request was refused then he said i pray thee therefore father that thou wouldst send him to my father's house for i have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But that request was refused. There's glad tidings of great joy for you, that the believer's danger of coming or going into that place of torment is so great that greater cannot possibly be, and that his belief will stand him in no stead at all but make his plight a thousand times worse than if he had not been a believer and that unbelief is the safer side christ himself being judge i quote no words but his to prove is the believer concerned to save his soul then shall he most assuredly be damned for being so concerned for christ hath said whosoever will save his soul shall lose it matthew sixteen twenty five is the believer a complete beggar if he be not so if he hath a rag that he doth call his own he will be damned to all eternity for christ hath said whosoever he be of you who forsaketh not all that he hath he cannot be my disciple luke fourteen thirty three is the believer a rich man and dreams he of going to heaven it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle matthew nineteen twenty four is he a man at all then he cannot be saved for christ hath said thou believest that there is one god saith st james thou dost well the devils also believe and tremble second james nineteen and so much good and no more than comes to damned spirits in the flames of hell is all the good that ever did and can come of believing for though thou hadst all faith so that thou couldst remove mountains saith st paul it should profit thee nothing first corinthians thirteen two well then let the good christian try what saving his prayers will do for him this is the good that they'll do for him and he hath christ's own word to comfort him in it he shall receive the greater damnation luke twenty forty seven well then since believing will not save him since faith will not save him since prayer will not save him but all so positively make things all the worse and none the better there's one other chance for him let him go and receive the sacrament the most comfortable sacrament you know of the body and blood of christ remembering as all good communicants should that he is not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs that fall from that table truth lord but dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from their master's table oh what happy dogs but let those dogs remember that it is also truth that he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself first corinthians sixteen twenty nine oh what precious eating and drinking my god is this thy table spread and doth thy cup with love o'erflow thither be all the children led and let them all thy sweetness know that table is a snare that cup is deadly poison that bread shall send thy soul to hell well then try again believer perhaps you had better join the missionary society and subscribe to send these glad tidings of these blessed privileges and this jolly eating and drinking to the heathen why then you have christ's own assurance that when you shall have made one proselyte you shall just have done him the kindness of making him twofold more the child of hell than yourself matthew twenty three fifteen 
is the believer liable to the ordinary gusts of passion and in a passion shall he drop the hasty word thou fool for that one word he shall be in danger of hell fire matthew five twenty two nay sirs this isn't the worst of the believer's danger would he but keep his legs and arms together and spare his own eyes and limbs he doth by that very mercy to himself damn his eyes and limbs and hath christ's assurance that it would have been profitable for him rather to have plucked out his eyes and chopped off his limbs and so to have wriggled and groped his way through the straight gate and the narrow way that leadeth unto life than having two eyes and two arms or two legs to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched mark nine forty three well then will the believer say what were all the miracles and prophecies of both the old and new testament for those unquestionable miracles and clearly accomplished prophecies if it were not that men should believe why absolutely they were the very arguments appointed by god himself to show us that men should not believe but that damnation should be their punishment if they did believe to the law and the testimony sir these are the very words of miracles saith god's words they are the spirits of devils that work miracles revelations sixteen fourteen and it is the devil who deceiveth them which dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he hath power to do revelations thirteen fourteen so much for miracles is it on the score of prophets and of prophecies then that you will take believing to be the safe side then thus saith the lord of hosts the god of israel the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means jeremiah five thirty one the prophet is a fool the spiritual man is mad hosea one seven thus saith the lord of hosts hearken not unto the prophets jeremiah twenty three fifteen o israel thy prophets are like the foxes of the desert ezekiel thirteen four they lie unto thee jeremiah fourteen fourteen and they shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever Revelations 20.10. And the punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Ezekiel 14.10. Nay, more than it is when God hath determined to damn men, that he in every instance causeth them to become believers, and to have faith in divine revelation, in order that they may be damned believers and none but believers becoming liable to damnation believers and none but believers being capable of committing that unpardonable sin against the holy ghost which hath never forgiveness neither in this world nor in that which is to come whereas all other kinds of blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men and all sorts of blasphemy wherewith soever they shall blaspheme but there is no forgiveness for believers mark three twenty eight for it is written for this cause god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned second thessalonian two eleven so when it was determined by god that the wicked ahab should perish the means to bring him to destruction both of body and soul was to make him become a believer i offer no comment of my own on words so sacred but these are the words hear thou therefore the word of the lord i saw the lord sitting upon his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left 
And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there stood forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord, and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all thy prophets. First Kings 22.22 there were four hundred of them. They were the goodly fellowship of the prophets for you, all of them inspired by the Spirit from on high, and all of them lying as fast as they could lie. So much for getting on the safe side by believing. Had Ahab been an infidel, he would have saved his soul alive. As it was, we may address him in the words of St. Paul to just such another fool. King Ahab, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest, but no better than I know that for that very belief fell slaughter on thy soul, and where thou soughtest to be saved by believing, it was by believing thou wert damned. So when Elijah had succeeded in converting the four hundred and fifty worshippers of Baal, who had been safe enough while they were infidels, and they began crying, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. The moment they got into the right faith, they found themselves in the wrong box. And the prophet, by the command of God, put a stop to their Lord Godding by cutting their throats for them. Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. First Kings, 1840. Oh, what a blessed thing, you see, to be converted to the true faith. Thus all the sins and crimes that have been committed in the world, and all God's judgments upon sin and sinners, have been the consequence of religion and faith and believing. What was the first sin committed in the world? It was believing. Had our great mother Eve not been a believing, credulous fool, she would not have been in the transgression. Who was the first reverend divine that began preaching about God and immortality? It was the devil. What was the first lie that was ever told, the very damning and damnable lie? It was the lie told to make folks believe that they would not be dead when they were dead that they should not surely die, that they should be as gods and live in a future state of existence. When God himself hath declared that there is no future state of existence, that dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Who is it, then, that prefers believing in the devil rather than in God, but the believer? And from whom is the hope of a future state derived, but from the father of lies, the devil. But if, in defiance of so positive a declaration of Almighty God, men will have it that there is a future state of existence after death, who are they who shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but unbelievers? Let them come from the north, from the south, from the east, or from the west. And who are they that shall be cast out? but believers, the children of the kingdom, as St. Peter very charitably calls them, cursed children. Second Peter 2.14 That is, I suppose, children with beards, children that never grew to sense enough to put away childish things, but did in gawky manhood, like newborn babes, desire the pure milk and lollipop of the gospel. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And who are they whom Christ will set upon his right hand, and to whom he will say, Come ye blessed of my Father? But unbelievers, who never troubled their minds about religion, 
and never darken the doors of a gospel shop but who are they to whom he will say depart ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels but believers every one of them believers chapel-going folks christ's blood men and incorrigible bigots that had been bothering him all their days with their lord lord to come off at last with no better reward of their faith than that he will protest unto them i never knew ye one text there is and only one against ten thousand of a contrary significancy which being garbled and torn from its context seems for a moment to give the advantage to the believer the celebrated nineteenth chapter of mark five sixteen he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned but little will this serve the deceitful hope of the christian for it is immediately added and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover can the christian show these signs or any of them will he dare to take up a serpent or drink prussic acid if he hesitate he is not a believer and his profession of belief is a falsehood let belief confer what privilege it may he hath no part nor lot in the matter the threat which he denounces against infidels hangs over himself and he hath no sign of salvation to show believing the gospel then or rather i should say professing to believe it for i need not tell you that there's a great deal more professing to believe than believing instead of making a man the more likely to be saved doubles his danger of damnation inasmuch as christ hath said that the last state of that man shall be worse than the first luke eleven twenty six and his holy apostle peter addeth it would have been better for them not to have known the way second peter two twenty one of righteousness the sin of believing makes all other sins that a man can commit so much the more heinous and offensive in the sight of god inasmuch as they are sins against light and knowledge and the servant who knew his lord's will and did it not he shall be beaten with many stripes luke twelve forty seven while unbelief is not only innocent in itself but so highly pleasing to almighty god that it is represented as the cause of his forgiveness of things which otherwise would not be forgiven thus st paul who had been a blasphemer a prosecutor and injurious assures us that it was for this cause he obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief first timothy one thirteen had he been a believer he would as surely have been damned as his name was paul and tis the gist of his old argument and the express words of the eleventh of the epistle to the romans that god included them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all unbelief being the essential qualification and recommendation to god's mercy not without good reason was it that the pious father of the boy that had the devil in him when he had need of christ's mercy and knew that unbelief would be the best title to it cried out and said with tears lord i believe help thou mine unbelief mark nine twenty four while the apostles themselves who were most immediately near and dear to christ no more believed the gospel than i do and for all they have said and preached about it they never believed it themselves as christ told them that they hadn't so much faith as a grain of mustard seed and the evangelist john bears them record to their immortal honour that though christ had done so many miracles among them yet believed they not john twelve thirty seven 
and the same divine authority assures us that neither did his brethren believe in him john seven five which then is the safe side sirs on the showing of the record itself on the unbelieving side the infidel stands in the glorious company of the apostles in the immediate family of christ and hath no fear while the believer doth as well and no better than the devils in hell who believe and tremble End section twenty two of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina